story short, six months of her, even he took, you know, dramatically, he, he almost poisoned himself because she kept refusing him. But finally, she agreed. And then Bassam, who was working two jobs um, and earning very little money and getting all of these social media posts from Europe from his friends showing how they, they were studying in Amsterdam. Another one was working in Munich. And he said, please, Doa, let's take one of these boats. Let's cross the Mediterranean Sea. We will marry. We will get married. You can study. I will work and we will be happy. And she had a near drowning experience as a young girl and was really reluctant and did not believe those smugglers who were showing them pictures of luxury boat liners. Um, at, but still, her hope was stronger than her fear. And so when they set off, it took them three attempts. They were arrested. It, it's a very dramatic story. Shot at as they were getting onto the boat. They finally boarded this boat. It was horrible. There were 500 fellow refugees, and they were shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet. It was smelly. Uh, they handed out stale bread and, and rancid, uh, rancid portions of food. The children were crying. Among them were little Sandra and Masa. Um, this is a picture of them as they readied themselves to get ready for this journey. So on day four in the water, four days and four nights, they collectively asked the captain, you know, when are we going to get to Europe? And he said, just 17 hours until you reach the shores of Italy. And they all broke out in song, and the sun was coming out, and they really were feeling a sense of hope. And she was holding onto Bassam's hand when she looked over the side of the boat and saw another boat coming after them, really, really fast, menacing men, throwing uh, sticks at them and, and yelling obscenities. Then we're like, what is this? And then they swept away, and then they came back, and then they started ramming a hole in the side of Doa's boat. And she said, Bassam, please not this, please not drowning. And the boat just started sinking, and they all fell into the water. Luckily, um, Bassam was able to find Doa, a child's floating ring, the, you know, the kind that um, babies use uh, in, in swimming pools. She was a very slight young woman, and she dangled her arms and legs on the side, and Bassam tread water next to her. Um, and on day one in the water, a man from a Palestinian man, he was a grandfather, um, came up to her with a tiny little girl, she was nine months old, named Malik, and said, please take this child. Um, she was whimpering. She was wearing pink pajamas, had only two teeth, and said, I've just lost 27 members of my family, and I can't go on. And so Doa took this child, and on day two in the water, Bassam started hallucinating and started saying, Doa, I am so sorry I put you in this terrible situation. Please forgive me, but I can't, I can't go on. And they had been watching people drowning around them all over, people giving up, taking their life jackets off and drowning. And she sa he just said, please, Doa, do everything you can to survive. And she had to watch as the love of her life drowned before her eyes. But she decided to do everything possible to save this little girl. And on day three in the water, and you remember that picture I showed you of the two little girls with the, with the life jackets? Well, the, uh, the, the, the littlest one, the 18-month-old Masa, the parents brought her over to Doa and said, we're not going to make it. Can you please take little Masa? So this is a rendition picture of what she, Doa, looked like on day four in the water. There were only 11 other survivors of the 500. And when she saw a boat in the distance, a merchant ship, and she yelled and she, uh, they saw the searchlights, Arab, 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 and finally, after two hours of searching, and I talked to the captain, they said that they did everything. They had been told by another merchant ship that there are only corpses in the water. To just give up. But the captain said, no, I really want to see. And this is, what, this is the actual ship that picked them up. Um, and there's little Masa. She was helicoptered, both of them, to the island of Crete. Unfortunately, Malik didn't make it. But Doa and Masa uh, survived. And... 
I turned this into a book. Uh, at first, it was in the form of a TED Talk, which has um, over a million and a half views. And I turned it into a book um, about Doa's life. And it is now in all kinds of languages. It's been optioned for a film. And the reason I'm telling you this story is, I mean, I could see that you were all listening, right? <laughs> when I put all those numbers up there, uh, it proved to me, because at the time I did this, I was working for UNHCR as the head of communications. And the responsibility of communicating on behalf of all of those people forced to flee was just so big. And I, it, it, you often have the tendency to say, I, I have to mention all of them. But when the, the way what people relate to is when you mention one of them. And what people relate to, and psychologists will tell you this, that you can actually, through a story like this, you can completely change people's minds. You can get people to kind of simulate, to even go into the experience and even live it themselves, even though it's so distant from their very comfortable lives. You can get them to feel empathy, and you can get them then to want to do something. So this has really been the goal. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. This is um, kind of the backbone of our communication strategy um, at the United Nations. Um, and it's a strategy that can, be, it can apply to anyone who's trying to communicate for the good of humanity. And that is to think about, of course, you know, we're working also at the UN in the context of climate change, um, we're, we're COVID-19, I mean, look at all the confusion, look at all the statistics, look at all the changing science. Um, so numbers and numbers and numbers and statistics and data, but we have, we possess as the UN unique data and unique numbers, and those data are so important, the science is so important, and we need to make sure that we are, um, communicating that science, but not getting people to shut off. Um, so the what is, yes, let's get the facts out. Let's get the information out. But just realize people are not, if you throw a report at them or a PDF document or a bunch of figures, you're not going to reach them. So you need to go through these two other steps. Why care? The why care is so important because it, it makes you go through a couple of other steps first. The two other steps first is, first of all, why am I communicating in the first place? Who am I communicating to? How do they receive information, generally? And how am I going to create a story that's going to resonate and get them to care? Those steps I see are often skipped in my profession. <laughs> Very often people jump to, let's, let's create a great product and hope people will watch it or see it. Or, so how are we going to get it to them too? But also, when we f we, if we do all those steps, we accomplish that and we open their hearts and get them to care about what's going on in our world. What are we going to ask them to do? So really also have that exercise. What is our call to action? Um, how could you personally get involved or be part? Or what is the UN doing about it? Um, what's the UN blueprint? Or finally, you know, is there a solution that somebody else found and that's been applied and that we could use as an example? So anyway, I wanted to leave you with that to introduce our panel today. And I'm going to now move over here. I think that was my last slide. I hope so. So and take on my role as moderator. It's um, the master class session that's about to begin. And we're going to hear from global experts on their top recommendations for designing stories to create positive social impact. Could I ask my master class fellow speakers to join me on stage, please? So we have 
I'm going to introduce you ahead of ahead of um, their speaking. I think you have all of their names, but first we're going to start by um, our, uh, in, inviting the co-founder of hashtag Our Stories, who is the former CNN senior special reporter, Mr. Yusuf Omar, and he's going to share with us his storytelling experiences. Thank you so much. Um, who's got vaccinated here? Who's been vaccinated? Yeah? I haven't been vaccinated. Microchips. Yeah? Bill Gates tracking us. See, that's a terrible story. We all believe the real story, right? It's actually accurate that vaccines could actually save our lives, that we could be in a room together again, pretty close to each other. Good story. Why are we wearing masks? Same thing, because of good storytelling. We know that masks help us. I've been a journalist for a long time. I've been a foreign correspondent in Syria. I've traveled to about 100 countries. I've seen bad and good storytelling. Bad storytelling is fluff, right? It's just distracting. We don't know what to focus on. Good storytelling is everything. It's literally what we get behind. It's what people, it galvanizes people to make real fundamental differences to address these goals, to address the sustainable development goals. It's so important, good storytelling. So in the context of mobility, sustainability, opportunity, we're going to be looking at three ways that you can create really good creative storytelling, especially to engage with young audiences. There is, number one, a huge opportunity for immersive storytelling. Everybody loves a good story, but especially if they can be part of that story. Sorry, I feel like I'm in your way. Especially if they can be part of that story. So like at the expo, there's so many interactions where you can touch things and do things and play games and experience things. That's immersive storytelling, and it's so good. Like, it goes right to the heart. You can also do it through a mobile camera. Augmented reality is where the future of technology is heading. At the moment, the main interaction with technology is like this lady. She's typing on a keyboard. But increasingly, the main interaction with technology is through the mobile camera. It's selfie lenses, it's Pokemon Go, it's getting directions through your camera. And we can do wild things in that space. My company's created augmented reality lenses where we can use a koala to navigate us through national parks in Australia. We've created lenses so you can use your face to recycle and sort between waste. You can use a bee and navigate it to find pollen and avoid pesticides. Interactions, games with your face, that engages young people. And we've seen 4 million people in the last year alone play these games. So people love it when they can interact with storytelling. Secondly, when we think about sustainability, we can't keep admiring the problem. Young people don't just want to know about problems in the world. We want to know how we can make them better, solutions-based storytelling. And that's what's so cool about the expo. I met the Rwandans yesterday. And they were like, yo, we got really big hills, really bad roads, and we need to deliver blood. So you know what we did? We got a drone, and we fly it to places. I was like, wow. I learned yesterday at the expo about in Peru, there was a farmer who basically set up these nets to stop other farm animals coming into his area. And those nets started collecting water. And he was like, wow, I can use nets to collect water. What a crazy idea. Once I traveled to Tanzania, and I met a woman who was training rats to sniff out landmines so farmers can get their land back. Crazy ideas. I met a woman in Kenya once who was creating hair wigs out of plants instead of plastic. Brilliant. And people engage with solutions-based storytelling. They want to watch it and they want to share it. In fact, in the last year, one billion views we've seen on our videos. We produce about a thousand stories a year. A billion views because people want to share solutions-based storytelling. And my third point, mobility. There is an opportunity to mobilize people around mobile journalism. We don't want to hear from experts and pundits, and no offense with the United Nations Secretary Generals. We want to hear from communities on the ground that are struggling with these issues and can share their solutions. But they have access to social platforms like Facebook and Instagram and all these platforms, but they often don't know how to tell a story. So if we can empower communities with the toolkits, with the skills, with the learnings, so that they can tell their own stories, we can amplify their voices to reach millions, billions of people and make real change. 
We've trained communities, 20,000 people in 140 countries to tell stories with mobile phones and with wearable camera glasses. These are a pair of cameras right now. They have screens inside. So within these three parameters that I've just laid out, within sustainability and solutions-based storytelling, within mobility and mobile journalism, within uh, opportunity to be immersive, we can fundamentally change the world. Greta Thunberg was once asked, what's the biggest impact that everyday people can have to change the world? And she said, we just need to be more conscious. And that is what good storytelling does, connecting minds and creating the future. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for inspiring us, and uh, absolutely, this community-based um, is so key. And it's also, I think, not us telling other people's stories. It's allowing people to tell their, their own stories. Um, that is so compelling. Sometimes we have to be the other their voices, um, but great. Very inspiring, and thank you so much. Uh, Yusuf, and let's move on to our next, next guest, who is Christina Monti, and she's the creative producer of Talk Up Radio, uh, and she served as the 218 UN Young Leader for the SDGs. You have the floor. So today I really want to focus on storytelling as a verb and you as agents of storytelling, rather than us telling you how to tell stories. So to do that, obviously, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, it's my story, just to preface that. So when I graduated from high school about a decade ago, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. No clue. The only thing I knew I wanted to do was to make positive impact in some way. And I had no idea how to do that, even though I'd been some sort of like student activist trying to change the world. But the real world happened and I didn't know what to do. So I looked around at all the people around me who were making impact in their own ways. And I, I reached out to them and I said, how can I help you? And one of the places that got back to me was a small media company in Jamaica called Talk Up Youth. And their whole thing is that they focus on young people as storytellers, as agents of telling their own stories. And what I did with them was we traveled around the island to the different high schools and we gave young people just a platform. We said, come, tell us what your issues are. Tell us what the solutions that you want to see implemented and we'll amplify your voices to decision makers and follow up with them to make sure that what you've asked for is actually heard. And from that experience, I just, my whole worldview changed. I, I, it completely blew my mind, the kinds of issues that were happening around the corner from my home that I had no clue about. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, that whole space of storytelling, not just as words that we give to people, things that we're offering to them, but something that we can co-create with them, a space where we can expand our understanding of humanity, a space where we connect with people with empathy and dignity and, and actually reach out to them and have them reach back at us. It's something that we're doing together, not just something that we're offering to them. And I'm so fascinated with this idea of making stories that when I had the opportunity to study for my master's, I decided to look into that. What, what does that mean? What, what kind of impacts can you see on like the international stage? So I worked with youth leaders in the UK who were creating their own media companies to cover youth stories in their own communities. And I found three major impacts that I want to share with you today. When young people create stories with communities rather than for communities, they develop a sense of civic imagination. And what we mean by that is that they get a sense of right and wrong in society, a sense of justice and injustice, a sense of a development of their own politics. Because they, in order to communicate with a community and to put their needs first, you start to understand what that community is struggling against and what they need to move forward in a more equitable way. You start to empathize with them. The second thing is they develop a sense of civic agency. Because you develop the skills, the talents, the networks in order to see yourself as being possible of making change, of pushing their voices forward, of, of understanding what they need and how to get there. 
The third thing is a sense of civic engagement. You really build community through this process. And not community in the abstract sense, but community in the tangible sense. There is no way to report on community-based stories other than to immerse yourself in community and to actually connect with people. And I think that's where the future of our world is going. You need to build networks, you need to build connections across borders, but also in your own spaces. And that's something that I've been able to do in my own work at Talk Up Radio as a senior creative producer, because I see my work not only as creating story, but creating spaces for storytellers to develop. So when we, when we bring a young person into Talk Up Radio and they're 18, like I was when I started, and have no clue what they're doing, and we can bring them along a journey where they develop their own voice, where they develop their own ideas on the world, where they, de- they develop a sense of, I can make a change, I can be a positive influence, and that the story is a vehicle for doing that. It's transformative. It's amazing. I've seen the the young people I work with move from having no clue what they want to do with their life to entering politics or to building companies or to building organizations and movements to actually transforming their communities in tangible ways. And all it took was bringing us together and talking about things and just doing that. So the three things I want to offer you today as pointers before I leave are just in order to do that, you have to start every story with empathy. You have to really understand people and give them the respect and dignity that they deserve to honor their stories. Two, you have to be responsible for every single word that you put out into the world and be willing to be accountable to the people and the stories that you're telling And three, have fun. Tell stories that you care about. Tell stories that you want to see in the world. Tell stories that you know will help to create the future that you want to see. So I'm going to leave. Um, Hi, I'm Christina. Uh, I'm a journalist, a writer, a creative producer, community communication specialist, all of these things. All it means is I'm a storyteller. And I think that as a storyteller, my focus in this world is to create spaces where we can find and refine our voices and our politics and find our pathways to action. And so that's what I want to encourage you to think of storytelling, not just as something that you offer, but something that has positive value for yourself and your communities as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for inspiring us with that, Christina. And uh, where can we hear Talk Up Radio? Oh, it's everywhere. So Talk Up Radio is streamed live on YouTube on Saturdays. It's also, if you have access to like online web, you can download the Nationwide app, which is the station that we work with. You can also watch all nine seasons of Talk Up Youth on YouTube. Just Google T-A-L-K-U-P-Y-O-U-T. You can watch the school tours that I spoke about at the start. They're also on YouTube. It's all there. So you can just check it out. Go on the website, find out about the social good projects, the work with UNICEF, all of that. (laughs) Yeah. Great. (laughs) Thank you so much. Uh, So next up, we have, last but last not no we have two other speakers because we have one coming to us from somewhere virtually so we are now going to turn to Catherine Bannister who is the chief strategy officer of Ogilvy for the Mena region uh and Miss Bannister please share with us your storytelling thank you so much and Christina, I'll definitely be tuning in, right? Sounds, sounds amazing. So thank you for this opportunity. It's such a pleasure and a privilege to come here today to talk to you a little bit about storytelling and narrative. I work in an industry that is essentially in the business of storytelling, narratives, and ultimately persuasion. And when I was asked to come today, I thought to myself, how can I help? As somebody who has been in the business possibly more years than than I care to remember or admit to, I thought, how can I apply my skills and knowledge and enable other storytellers out there? Traditionally, I tend to work with brands, uh, NGOs, uh, different types of products and, and, and technology, for example. And we are in the art of persuasion. We are looking to change people's either behavior or their beliefs. So we fundamentally have some uh, 
uh, insight, I, I guess, in terms of actually how we can enable that. And honestly, the story you told Melissa earlier today, I think it will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, and I thought to myself, how can I help? What is it that I have to impart that can enable others to, to either tell better stories or actually tell stories that change people's perceptions and, and change people's minds? And I really just only have two things to impart today, but hopefully they may enable you to think differently about storytelling. So one of the things that we often think about is what is the truth at the heart of the story? Sometimes we talk about it being an insight, but fundamentally it is what is the nugget that will actually either be revelatory or will change people's perceptions. And uh, something that has stayed with me throughout my career is actually something from the health and wellness um, industry. It's from the oral care industry. And I remember being... Uh, in several focus groups and, and talking to uh, consumers. And, and one of the things that I learned from that is actually the business of oral care or cleaning your teeth actually is a very private act that has very public consequences. And I found that a beautiful insight and it actually changed my mind wholly how I thought about that industry particularly. So my advice here from a storytelling or narrative perspective is find a nugget and put it at the heart of is find a nugget and put it at the heart of yours to think differently about something or have a has a revelationary aspect to it that changes beliefs and behaviors. I think if you're able to do that, then actually people's expectation, and again, Melissa talked earlier about the facts and figures and how people are a little bit blind and it washes over them and they've heard it all before and, and you know, I want to help, but I don't really know how to, or I might be motivated, but I'm not really going to change what I'm doing day to day. I think actually by opening people's minds and presenting information, presenting storytelling in a way that's quite different actually enables you to open people's hearts and minds. So that's something that, that we do. We, we work very hard to get to the truth, to the whole nugget at the center of something. The other thing that we do uh, as communication experts is often think about what we describe as the way in. So how am I going to get into this story? Am I going to go through myth-busting, for example? Might I even go at it through humor? How can I enable this story to actually be accessible to people? How can I present it in a way that's quite different? And that actually, again, when we are trying to be persuasive with individuals, the onus is on us very much to engage and also to uh, touch people emotionally. I think both my um, counterparts up here have used that word today, and I think it's really important that we, that we consider that, because we know emotion is much more telling. Emotion stays with people much longer than facts and figures. And therefore, when you engage people emotionally, that, that actually, you know, the heart of it is their recall, what they remember, what stays with them the next day, the week after, and the following month is actually much more, more powerful. So when I said to myself, how as a communication expert can I help? I thought I would impart these two aspects um, in terms of what is the insight, what is the, the truth, and how can you present that in a way that is revelatory and different and original, and maybe is very acceptable when people hear it, but actually isn't their first thought. And my second observation really is about how do you give people a way into this story? If it's a, an object that you would turn in your hand, you know, what are the different ways that you would sort of get at it and, and come into it? And I think um, if, if you remember those two aspects, then hopefully it's helpful from a storytelling um, and a narrative perspective. Uh, and just to say thank you again for the opportunity, and uh, I hope that was somewhat insightful. And uh, back to you, Melissa. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Catherine, and absolutely, I'm sure we can also learn from the from the private sector. Um, often, the private sector has many more resources than we do. Um, 
in the public sector and, and um, giving us the kind of insights that you did um, also, uh, yeah, what is the essence of what we're trying to communicate and then how are we going to get people to relate to it? So that relate uh, bridge is so key. Um, if I can relate, then I might care, I might feel something. And if I feel something, then I'm going to be motivated to do something. So with that, let's move to our final speaker this afternoon, Mr. Philip Thomas. He's going to be joining us virtually. Mr. Thomas is chairman of Khan Lions, um, as well as president of Essentials Marketing Division. Do we have Mr. Thomas online? Hi, hi. How are you? Hello. 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 Hi there. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you for asking me to say a few words. So as Melissa mentioned, I run a festival of creativity called Can Lions. <laughs> and it's creativity for marketing, communications and advertising. And that's the angle I want to come at today. Because I think when you talk about storytelling, for me, it's best to take one step back and accept really that great storytelling is except really that great storytelling is talking about, I think, is great creativity. Because without the right environment for creativity, there really can be no great stories. Uh, advertising and marketing, Melissa mentioned the private sector a second ago, it is the most powerful industry on earth for setting the agenda and shaping culture. And that's simply because of the billions and billions of dollars that is spent by brands communicating ideas. And those ideas can be for good or sometimes not for good. So marketing and advertising communications, it really, really matters. It shapes culture in a way that even film and novels and music struggle to do so. But the, the advertising industry is sometimes, not always, but sometimes a case study in what to avoid when being truly creative. Because the creative people in our industry... They're set rules and challenges that literally no other creative endeavor has to cope with. Now, if they can release their creativity properly and truly, then brands can help to tell these stories in a really, really powerful way. So I think it's instructive to have a look at what gets in the barrier. What are the barriers? What gets in the way of creativity in our industry? Because I think if you can find out what the barriers are, you can find out ways around them, and then you can start to tell truly great stories. So the barriers. Well, I think problem number one is there are too many people. So the best definition of creativity that I ever heard came from the great John Hegarty, who founded BBH, which is an agency in the UK. Creativity, he said, is an expression of self. And my definition is quite similar. I think of creativity as being simply something existing in this world only because you exist in this world. So for me, that could be anything, creating a, cooking a great meal for some friends, posting something on social media, writing a novel. All these things are the definition of creativity. But it is striking, isn't it, how many of the things we describe as truly creative, the bedrock of storytelling, they are solo endeavors. You know, even huge projects like making a movie, actually, when it does boil down to it, they're the vision of one director. Sure, sometimes scripts are written with lots of different writers, but I think it's fair to say that most of the terrible Hollywood movies in the world have the most writers and the best, best movies in the world have one writer. And if you think about novels, paintings, music, they're nearly all solo endeavors. Even John Lennon and Paul McCartney, it turns out they wrote alone, not together. But in our industry, in this incredibly powerful communications industry of marketing, we're expected to throw a team together into a room and we expect them to come up with a great idea. Now, consensus can water things down and it can lead to groupthink. And our industry can learn, I think, from every other creative endeavor in the world about a solo idea coming from a sense of self. So first lesson could be 
give the brief to someone you trust, somebody in the agency group that you truly trust, make them lead on it, give them the final decisions to make the idea an expression of themselves. It doesn't mean there can't be a team, of course there can be, but it just means somebody needs to lead. Problem number two, the stories that our world tells are one removed. So what do I mean by that? Well, the advertising industry and brands, when they're telling their stories, those stories are not purely to be enjoyed just for themselves, but they are to tell a brand or an organization's story as well. Again, it's so different from a movie or a book. And this can lead to all sorts of contortions. You know, people asking for changes, people trying to change things to tell a different kind of story, the story of the brand rather than the genuine story of what you're trying to say. So the creativity in advertising is about applied creativity rather than pure creativity. But I think the lesson here is to be true to the story that you're telling, as true to that story as you are to the product or the brand. And I think the audience will love you for that. Uh, many brands have done this really with great success. There's a brand called Guinness, the beer, grand, beer brand. It's been incredibly successful in making content, telling stories that don't really mention Guinness at all. They don't feature the brand at all. And I think this just gives more power to the stories. Third problem, third and last problem. The people with the money, the chief executives, the boards, they don't rate great advertising because the marketing people are not aligned to the objectives of the business. I think it's a huge myth that brand managers and CMOs don't rate or understand creativity. They do. But we've done a big piece of research at Cam Lions that shows this incredible mismatch between what agencies think brands believe and what brands actually believe. Brands do believe in creativity. Marketers do believe in storytelling. But their problem is their bosses don't, the CEOs don't, the brands, the, 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 the boards don't. So I think the third lesson is instead of arguing about whether agencies truly believe in storytelling or whether brands truly believe in storytelling and who is the most creative, I think agencies and brands should come together, join forces and use every scrap of data, every single piece of evidence that proves that creativity and storytelling drives growth. And if you can tell stories that truly resonate and do good in the world, it will ultimately make more money and grow the brands that you're working for. So I think there are many other things that we can do to unleash creativity of our storytellers. And the fact that there is so much amazing creativity globally that comes from our industry on behalf of the SDGs, for instance, and on behalf of many of the stories that Melissa was talking about. It never ceases to amaze me how much wonderful creativity there is. But I do think if we can get around some of our barriers with the money, the power, and the billions of consumers that these brands touch every day, we could become the greatest storytellers in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. And um, yes, it may, let's make it our aspiration that these the greatest storytellers of the world are not just selling brands, but they're selling um, ideas like sustainability and um, being good citizens of the world and that they can, as they sometimes very generously do, um, lend us their storytelling expertise um, for those of us who do not have big marketing budgets. And uh, um, so we, we, we thank you for making these connections for us, um, which are so often really invaluable. Um, so we, we have a little bit of time for discussion. And I see a very apt audience here. So I. I'd like to kind of bring bring you in. Um, I, how much time do we have left? Because I came with this really nice watch um, with a really nice Swiss brand, but it stopped. <laughs> and uh, 
20 minutes for discussion, yes. And I could, for the cost of what it would take to get a new battery for this watch, I could probably buy an entirely new swatch or something. But anyway, um, that could be a story. I, <laughs> I would love, um, I, you know, I have some, some questions that, you know, I think I'd really like to get around the, these areas of what creates story. I thought it was really interesting what Philip said about that the creativity of most often comes from the individual and not necessarily a whole collective getting around and, and this is where. But so I'm wondering if anybody here would like to share a story um, that you have worked on or that you have felt compelling that you felt not only um, just opened people's hearts but got them to do something. Maybe just one of you. Um, does anybody have a story you'd like to share? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Saka. Uh, I'm a singer, and I also study journalism. So I have a story because one year I went to Congo, Democratic. I went to visit my grandmother, and I was in the forest of Goma. And there was the, uh, the forest of the gorillas. Yeah, one day I went there with my grandma and my mom, and we were seeing people exploring the forest, but in an illegal way. And the same forest, they had like a river where they were like looking for minerals to, to build the phones and computers. I think it's Mika, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. And they were like contaminating the river because people from that village, they drink water and they do things with the water from the river. So my grandmother and other of their like neighbors, they got contaminated by that exploration they were doing. And some people got blind like for years and years because of that contamination. And the government from Congo actually knows about it, but they don't do much to protect the villagers because they gain something with that. And most of those companies that are there, they're illegal. And they're trying like to profit um, by forcing people from that village to look for the minerals for them, and they don't even get paid. So most of them lost their houses, especially my grandmother. She went back uh, with us in Angola, and they lost their houses because the government needed a way to pay the companies because of the exploration. So they had to be relocated to another place in tents. Then they didn't even get houses or proper conditions for that. So. This, was a, this is a story that I lived and that my grandmother told me. So I think it's very sad because till this day, I went there in 2018, but till this day, they're still doing these type of activities. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And again, I think that's a really good example of a story of, remember my slide with the what, why care, what now? Um, I mean, the what is that you told us the story of a really devastating, you know, I think you told it in a way where I think we all feel like we could care, but I think ah, the next part is the what now. So how, how are we going to enact change? That would be our approach at the United Nations because we don't want to leave people hanging. But, so let's, let's hope that you find a, a solution for that change. Yes, please. Just on that story, it's such a powerful story, but often, unfortunately, when something's so grim, people don't give a shit. Like, it's sad, but it's true. Mm. And one way to help them care is to make it apply to them, as you said, yes. relevance. So for me, there's two ways to approach that story. One of them is, woman goes blind because of chemicals in water. Yeah. So far away, it doesn't apply to me. The true impact of your mobile phone very, mm -hmm. now it's connected to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. It's the device in my pocket and the repercussions of that device in the supply chain. I think the word your is really mm -hmm. critical when we think about storytelling and how we can apply that story far away in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, somebody in New York mm -hmm. or Australia or Dubai or anywhere in the world. Mm. I think that's a really good point. Um, then you say, do you know what's in your phone and the consequences mm -hmm. of it? Does anybody else from the panel want to react to this? To uh, yes, this story? I'd, I'd love to build on that point. I, I think also one of the things that I was reminded of when I was listening to, to that story, and my heart goes out to the, the villagers, also is how narrative can be powerful and how actually when you uh, construct a narrative and, 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 and reproduce it, how it can be shared on. Because 
in that instance, my observation is that one narrative seems to be more powerful than the other based because, it, because it's exuded by a, a government or, or so-called powerful individuals. But I think it's equally powerful the other side. It just doesn't have the platform or the opportunity mm. to get out there. And I think the example of, of making it relevant is extremely powerful. And that's one way that you can enhance that narrative so that it becomes the, the more dominant one, for want of, of a better I I expression. Right. Yeah, and in adding to both of your points, in doing that, I think, you know, you've brought the right approach to this in bringing it from an authentic voice, yeah. from someone who lived it, from someone who understands it very much intimately. And I think in pulling this and pulling other people into the story, it's going to be important to remember that core and to keep connected to it. Because sometimes I think we get lost when we try to make it relevant to everybody else. And even if people do not care, in, in pulling humanity forward, even if you connect it to them, we need to connect them to the core of what you were talking about. Never lose the story at the center. That's why even now I remember the names of the people mm. you, were spoke, you spoke about earlier. I remember the details of the story. Even though I have never lived that and I'm not connected to it, but when you bring it back to the core of what happened mm. in order to relate it, I think we should never lose sight of that part of it. And, and that's where you get the emotion from outside of the connection, the hard part of it, I think. Right. And um, then maybe let me just challenge Philip to what if um, you were representing a mobile phone company um, and this story came out? let's say, in The Guardian about her grandmother um, and, and the villagers going blind, losing their homes um, at, at the expense of exploitation of, of minerals there that are going to mobile phones um, in this company you represent. Yeah, I mean, I think there are probably two parts of this. One is the, the kind of public relations element to it. Mm -hmm. But much more importantly, I think, is what role do these organizations play in the world that we're trying to build and I deal with a lot of big brands global brands who are touching billions of people every day and the thing that I'm really struck by and uh, I know Maha knows this very very well well the thing that I'm struck by most is that the leaders of those brands actually genuinely do care that the, the idea that the that the that the leaders of these capitalist organizations don't care is generally, in my experience, not true. They are trying to make the world a better place. Now, they're within their, within, they've, they've got guardrails that they have to operate in. They've, they're, they're, there's realism that they have to deal with. They're not, um, they're not activists. They don't have the, the luxury of being activists, unfortunately, but they are, in my view, trying to do the, the right thing. Even if they weren't trying to do the right thing, they're pragmatic enough to know that the way to engage, especially young people, is to, to, to actually care. And I think this has caused a huge shift in the way that these organizations are dealing with their supply chains. It's not just the stories they tell, it's actually the way they're running their businesses. Uh, the way that they're dealing with their supply chains uh, and uh, everything from diversity to the SDGs to the impact on the environment. And I think as we as the as younger people become the leaders of these organizations, that can only increase and get better. So I'm quite hopeful about the role that businesses and organizations like that can play in making the world a better place. Thank you, Philip. That's, that is hopeful, and I, that just shows also the ripple effect of environmental storytelling um, and a, a, a youth, um, the youth activism that is, um, these, are, these are very important customers, um, and they're also very important uh, members of workforces, and so, it's, so business is taking them seriously. I'd like to ask anyone here, is there any aspect of storytelling um, that you think that we missed? Is there anything anybody would like to add uh, from your experience? You are all creators, too. Yes? Uh, 
Hi, my name is Christelle. It's not actually to add, but it's something to build upon something that you said. And it's a personal story. So I lost my dad like six years ago to a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I decided I want to do my part to make the world a better place and become an advocate for cardiac diseases and like raise awareness for uh, the risk factors and everything. So it started on my social media. And when I used to address people and mainly men, when I started to talk about the statistics and talk about the risk factors, and I never wanted to actually talk about my story because I felt it was like too dramatic. But it never really made any difference. I never felt the difference. And it's only when I started, when I thought to myself like, okay, I'm gonna start injecting my personal story in my videos on Instagram. So I actually started talking about my personal story how it happened. It was at three in the morning, he was driving, he had a heart attack, and I had to manage everything. And then I would start like um, including the risk factors and then asking people like, if you know someone in your family who has any of these risk factors who's at risk, please let them get checked. So this is when my stories and my videos started to go viral, started to gain a lot of engagement, a lot of views, a lot of reshares, and I started getting many, many messages from people like, yeah, I took uh, an appointment for my husband, for my son. I'm taking an appointment for myself. So this is when I thought and I knew the power of like really injecting this personal experience in this, uh, in storytelling. And I knew like there's no such thing as being dramatic. It's just a fact and it's just for me, maybe it, like it's just like as you just said, the emotional side that gets people to actually take action, and this is the thing that makes actually a change in the world. So thank, thank you for this. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I think you you touched on on something incredibly important, and that is, if you care, mm. then other people will care too. If people can feel how much. You are affected. Yeah, I can't I even do, feel it like, now. I used to I, do like, it from the heart. Like, please, I know you smoke. I know you have a history yeah. of cardiac disease. Just go get yourself checked. It's that easy. Just because, like, yeah. it's it's something that you can avoid and you can make a difference in, like, very easily. So this is yeah. how, why I took it at heart. Yeah. Just, no, I think that that's very true. Just on that story, I mean, that, like, that left a lump in my throat. Mm -hmm. Like, it's sad, right, to know that you lost your father six years ago. Two suggestions in terms of structuring stories. Mm. One, put that emotion right up the top as you've started to do, right? Grab me in the opening three, five, ten seconds of the video. I lost my father and I'm going to tell you how. Two, consider not giving it all away in the opening minute, mm. right? If you look at especially social media platforms today, they're looking at retention and watch time. They don't just want views. They want to know that people watch the whole two or three minutes. So... When structuring a story like yours, um, it's really important to, to, to basically keep people on cliffhangers throughout to, to get to the end. So they learn, my dad left at three, and it would be the last time I'd see him. He drove, da 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 da, -da as opposed to my dad uh, went on a drive, had a heart attack, and died, and I'm going to tell you about the obesity. Does that make sense? I was sense? with him. Oh, you're with him? Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> word. He was in the driver's seat. Wow. Hmm. The, the um, passenger. The passenger seat. <laughs> and I think the other thing I would say is, so you've got this story, but you've got one story, right? But there will be a community of people like you around the world who have lost exactly. their moms, dads, brothers, sisters. The number one cause of death for women and men. Yeah, exactly. So like Kristen is doing in the, in the communities, there's an opportunity to establish a community there, to provide them with the tools to tell their own stories, to curate those stories, and to create a much bigger movement here. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. And, and Thank just you. to build on the point of emotion, I mean, it, it's absolutely proven beyond any doubt that emotion is more communicative and more influential than any facts and figures. Any, you know, it, it, it seems counterintuitive in a society today where you know, so so called you know facts and, and information and, and, and data and depth of research. And in no way am I dismissing that. It's incredibly important. But connecting with people and, and enabling them to relate to your story in, in a relatively short amount of time, because you only have you know seconds or, or, or minutes with an individual, 
is, is beyond doubt uh, the most powerful thing that we can do in, in, in storytelling. And, and it's come through as a thread in everything that everyone has said today so far. Yeah, right. Mm. <laughs> Excellent. Did yeah, you want to comment, Kathleen? Just yeah. one small thing. Um, when you have a story that powerful and you're sharing from so much from your heart, I just want to remind you to take care of yourself mm. as well. Because these, these stories are so powerful, they're so touching, and you give so much of yourself to this cause and to this movement, but you're also a person, and you know, especially when you're sharing it online, the internet can be so unforgiving and so terrible sometimes. Mm -hmm. So in everything that you're doing, especially if you're going to create a community, community values must come through very strongly there, and self-care and, and caring about the story and respect for each other and dignity, just keep them in mind, even as you push and even as you fight, that you're still, you matter. You understand your voice, your story, it's powerful, it's important, but it's yours. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. It's a wonderful experience, you know, hearing from the connoisseurs and, and uh, uh, stories of uh, different facets of the life and, and very touching, you know. In fact, you know, the one which you narrated, you know, I, I, I simply could not stop my tears, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, my story starts 10 years before I was born. Uh, in 1958, my father landed in Dubai started to start a business. And uh, he's one of the first few businessmen in the building material uh, uh, business. Uh, and by decree of, uh, you know, by the order of His Highness Sheikh Rashid, father of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, we are exempted from sponsors. So, you know, there is a local requirement to have a sponsor. Currently, it has been abolished, but earlier we used to. And my father came from Bahrain. From, 70, uh, from 44 to 58, he was in Bahrain. Now, we are originally from India. And uh, if you see, you know, India was quite advanced in 58 compared to what Dubai was at that time. You know, when my father landed here, there was no water supply, no electricity, no roads, no cars, and no airport. There was a small airport in Sharjah where he landed. And compared to that, India had his own airline, electricity, roads, air condition, everything. So I used to ask him that what made you stay here for a few years in the beginning, five, six years, without basic civil amenities. And he used to say that we had a vision that this place will grow. So I used to ponder that, you know, how can this, you know, be so powerful, a vision that can translate into such a modern city where, you know, the 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 a graduation or considered as a PhD of a city is to host an expo. So um, when I did my PhD in leadership, I wrote in my thesis that, you know, vision is seeing the invisible. Everybody saw when they came to Dubai as a, as a desert city, and the ruler of the Dubai that time saw a beautiful city coming out of it. And the best part of that, that this vision was that, you know, normally visions are made on the top. But here in Dubai, the, the most charismatic thing was that that vision disseminated to the last person in the society without diminishing its values. So what the rulers saw, every person living in Dubai saw and aligned with the same vision. And we are so blessed to be in Dubai. And Dubai has given us a lot of things. Our business flourished from Dubai to many uh, different countries. We have three manufacturing unit, one in US, two in India and business in more than 80 countries. So, you know, the, 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 the message in this is that the vision which creates things. And Sheikh Rashid, you know, His Highness Sheikh Rashid, he built five pillars of Dubai. You know, he built World Trade Center, Dubai International Airport, Dry Dock, and created such ecosystem in Dubai where the business thrived. And His Highness Sheikh Mohammed took it to the level, to the pinnacle where, you know, Everybody talks about Dubai right now. I remember once I went to U.S. first when I joined my father's business in 1990. After that, I went to U.S. and I gave my credit card on the Houston airport. And uh, it was, and that lady asked me, from which country this card is? I said, oh, it's from Dubai. She asked me, where is Dubai? I said, in UAE. She asked me, where is UAE? I said, next to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, okay. So th those days, you know, in the geography of the GCC was was not so well known to others. Now, if I go in any country and I say I'm from Dubai, the first thing they say is, wow. 
So that wow effect has been created uh, all over the world, and that, that's what we see currently in Dubai, 190 countries exhibiting in Dubai, and people from more than 200 countries visiting. So this is the, 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 the power of the vision. And in these three and a half months, you know, I've been, uh, I met a lot of Af uh, African nations in GBF Africa, in, in Spotlight Africa, and all this. And when they, when they talk about development, I say it's easy. You know, we have seen it happening in Dubai. You can do it, provided you have a right leadership, right vision, right strategy, and you can do it. So, you know, so many things what we, we can see on the development, Dubai has become a precedence and created a roadmap for them to progress. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that was an inspiration not seeing that we're sitting here it's, and it is hard to, hard to imagine um, okay, what you, the on. picture you just painted. And uh, thanks for also that insight about having a vision um, because that's also hope. Just really Reaction quickly, and then, yeah. on, the, on the Dubai story, Dubai's not perfect, but it does have a good story to tell, right? And you say 50 years ago, a bunch of excellencies had a vision and they materialized that vision. Now, I'm obsessed with augmented reality. The idea that, you know, through your mobile phone, you can layer stories onto the world. That is a perfect example of where it can actualize, where somebody can literally with a mobile phone, open it up and see something that's not there today. And that's a really useful thing, especially... Dubai is one example, but in other emerging markets, right? If you can take a farmer and say, oh, you've got this land. This is what it could look like if you planted these seeds. Oh, you've got this space. This is what it could look like if we built a school or a sanitation uh, space here. So sometimes it's really hard to communicate vision and say, hey, this desert's going to be a big city in 50 years' time. Today, we have amazing storytelling technologies that help people project their vision physically onto the world. Great. Let's do that. Imagine a world. Yes, last question here. Oh, just this last question. Is that on? Oh, okay, yes. thank you. Um, I want to thank the young lady here. She inspired me to tell a story I had like two years ago. My dad, uh, the voice of my dad changed. And then we have in our culture, I'm from Egypt, we have in our culture that, um, that our parents don't usually go to doctors to check. And uh, he refused to check. His voice is changing. It's about to go away. And when he finally decided to check, he found out that he has cancer in his throat. And then he, to, um, they have to take, uh, he lost his voice eventually. And that was before my, me moving here. So not be, being able to connect with him by voice and to miss his voice while he's alive. Um, that was terrible. My question is, I, I'm a journalist, but I don't share personal stories because mm. I cannot take any hate speech on the social media. I cannot stand any hate comment because actually in our culture too, um, if you rescue a dog or a cat, people can tell you and comment, go rescue human, uh, go feed human, and they can judge you and criticize you. And I publish other stories, but I cannot tell now. You are very inspiring that you could publish your story and inspire people and do this community. But I, I admit that I don't have the courage yet to publish something personal because I cannot stand any hate comments or speech. So as uh, professionals here, I want to ask about this. How can I deal with those insecurities? While I have too many stories, actually, um, how to share them without feeling insecure about getting hate comments? Thank you. If I can just say one thing first, because I, uh, I, I, I know a bit of, of what you feel because I'm a woman on the internet and I'm on social media a lot. And unfortunately, women are actually targeted mm. much worse uh, than men are um, and receive much more hate and nasty comments and... Um, so I, I, for me, I, it took. It, I'm a very sensitive person too, and I can't. I, I take any kind of these kinds of things to heart. But I've I've developed some kind of inoculation against um, and just seeing them for what they are and kind of feeling sorry for them and just trying to ignore them because I think I, the times when I have shared, like for example, I had 
cancer and I went through cancer and I survived and I, I went through so much thought, do I share this story? And I finally wrote it um, and I put it out there on Medium and um, what breast cancer taught me. And I can't even tell you, just it, it would benefited so much more. I have, to this day, I wrote it like three years ago after I came out. So many young women, older women, come to me and say, thank you for writing that. Um, can I seek your advice? Or say, it's just, it brings so much more positive and makes so many more connections than the negative. Um, so I think, I think in general, um, if you are who you are um, and you put out there what hurt you, what moves you, what your life experience is, what your story is, and what you're passionate about, you're going to get a community of people who are going to be with you and we can forget the rest. Mm. Huh? Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's point number one, that, you know, you are the story that you're telling is going to connect with people and they actually need to hear your voice. But I think point number two is that it's your voice. You have, all of us have a limited time here as human beings having this experience of being alive. And we've always been blessed with a perspective with uh, identity, and I think it's, it's a tragedy not to represent yourself in the ways that you want to, you know, to be authentic in the ways that you want to show up in the ways that only you can, because I will never be able to understand the ways that you have incarnated in this plane. It, it, I will never get it, but to hear from you is a blessing to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to step into your shoes and to see life from another perspective. Obviously, not everybody on the internet or even in life appreciates this. So in doing so, I think another thing that you need to consider is setting your own boundaries, doing it at your own pace. Mm -hmm. And if you need to shut off the comments, do that. If you need to write it and run away from the computer and don't look at it for five days, do that. Mm -hmm. Always protect your own boundaries. Always protect your own voice. Always do what you need to do to get through it and to build up that stamina so that one day when the person says something to you you can answer them back and say I don't care what you just said this story is important and I'm going to tell it because one two three four five people needed to hear it anyway so you are one voice in in the echo I don't need to hear from you I need to tell this story because it matters to me and that is enough it doesn't need to catch everybody if you tell it and you feel you know moved by the fact that it was told then Everything else after that is, as we say in Jamaica, brata. It's extra. It's, you know, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Our time is running out, so I'm going to not go to every one of our panelists, except we have one more question from Kirsten. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. There's so much wealth of knowledge on this stage right now. And I wanted to just take the moment to ask um, one question that is really burning at the hearts of all of us here at Expo. As you've seen during this whole week, we have really rolled out the red carpet in terms of bringing in the SDGs and bringing this group of community together to really tackle the question about how do we bring the SDGs to life and get more people to care about them. And so I want to start with Philip um, and to ask, who is himself a big advocate for the SDGs, to ask how we can build a movement. And starting here in Dubai, taking all the lessons that we've learned with communicating about them and getting people who have never heard about them invested, how would you do that? How would you build a movement here in Dubai and then bring it further to the world? Um, thank you very much for the question. I think pro probably two, two things. Um, I think the first is to, to try and simplify <laughs> the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, there are 17 of them. Very few people, perhaps Melissa, but not many other people could actually uh, list them all. And I do think that choosing to communicate specific ones that are very mm -hmm. important for the region, say, or important for Dubai or important for individuals, or important for organizations. For me, that that really helps because, I mean, the, the debate around the number of SDGs is a very long running debate. There are a lot of experts who know a great deal about it. But the fact is, there are a lot. So I, th I think the, the first thing would be, which ones do we do we really want to try and make a difference with? And then the second, what, what I found anyway, is the work that we've done with the SDGs would be completely impossible without our partners. 
partners, obvious partners like the UN. Um, we've had a partnership with the UN for many, many years. We couldn't possibly do what we do without the UN and their expertise, but also other well-meaning partners outside of that in the private sector, other charities. And for us, um, the little bit that we've done on the SDGs has only been possible because of the partnerships that we've created. So I think those two things are, are really what I've learned from our journey with the SDGs. Yeah, thank you so much, Philip, and thanks for that question because I think it's uh, it's absolutely absolutely key. again back to that make it relevant, um, right? Um, if you say, oh, there are seventeen SDGs, and it's that back to that number thing. That's why nobody can remember them because see, it's num seventeen isn't even that big of a nut, and and it's still really really hard. But when you look at that, what stands behind the numbers, and you say. Oh, yeah, clean water, that's really important. This river is so toxic that runs through our city. And the, so make it locally relevant, talk about the issues, and then tell the story. That's going to make people um, really uh, open up their hearts and say, where do I help? Thank you so much, dear panelists, and uh, thank you so much to all of you for joining with us and participating. I think, I, I think there are lots of more stories here, but um, I think we can continue with, um, is it a workshop or there's, uh, there's more sessions to come. So all the best to everybody and take care. Sure, the uh, okay, the mic is on. Many thanks, uh, Your Excellency, Melissa, Catherine, Christina, Yusuf, and uh, Mr. Philip, virtually. Um, I'll close my notes because uh, I was personally touched with the story that uh, Her Excellency Melissa uh, has provided us with. I can still remember the names, Dua, Malik, and Masa. It was uh, very touching. One aspect that I would like to contribute uh, is the science behind storytelling. While uh, Her Excellency was telling us a story, our brains were inducing a lot of hormones. We were personally connected because uh, stories are personally connecting, they're impactful, and they're meaningful. Our brains induced a lot of happy hormones and personally connecting hormones, oxytocin, cepricin, endorphins, serotonin, all those hormones are happy hormones, and that's exactly what happened. And then um, Christelle here told us the story about her father, and we, got, we all got personally connected to her. And what happened to our brain is that it induced that oxytocin. We felt, we felt we were personally connected to her. I just saw a lady hugging her. And oxytocin is a hug hormone. That lady had uh, oxytocin flooding in her brain, so she came all the way to Crystal and hugged her because we got personally connected. That's one aspect to, to storytelling, the science behind storytelling. There is a book that I suggest you all read, uh, narrated, um, written by a good friend of mine, Mr. Will Storr, also an author of uh, a book, Selfie, and uh, recently he published another book called Stats Game. That's where I got the inspiration to become a storyteller, the book that he wrote. Uh, without further ado, uh, once again, Thank you to the uh, panelists, and um, in line with the principles of um, storytelling, uh, I'd like to welcome our next panelist. Virtually, uh, Ms. Ina Moja will be joining us. She's the UNCCD Land Ambassador, co-founder of Code Green and a Changemaker. Also, I would like to uh, welcome physically to our guest today. Um, we cannot be multi-dimensional. We cannot afford one-sided stories about other people or communities. To ensure we all express our voice, it is now my pleasure to invite Jennifer Kolpas, the CEO of Tierra Grata. Welcome, Ms. Jennifer. And uh, last but not least, we'd like to uh, welcome um, Ms. Selin Ozanaldum from uh, Turkey, the founder of Girl Up in Istanbul. Please. 
Um, not sure if uh, Ms. Ina Moja is with us virtually here. If uh, Hello. She's... Hi, Ina. Hello. Good to see you. Hello, everyone. Ina, the, uh, the mic is yours. Please do proceed your story. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here uh, virtually. Unfortunately, I couldn't be present physically. Um, so I'm a musician, visual artist, and a filmmaker. And to me, storytelling is essential in my work. So uh, also being a women's rights and climate activist, sustainability have always been present in what I share with people. And uh, as a lot of my fellow speakers said this morning, uh, emotions are so important. People are more open to receive messages through art because art connects directly with the heart and emotions of people. And with art, you can share the most powerful messages from the sweetest to the most devastating stories. You can spark conversation uh, and that is much needed for society to be able to debate, to evolve and to transform. And so what personally I did is when I started my career as a musician, I was 25 years old. And, uh, but I started my, uh, my activism journey when I was 19 years old because of my own personal story. Uh, when I was, I will share a little bit of that with you. When I was four years old, uh, my mother and my brother and I went to my home country in Mali. And uh, both my parents are feminists. They consider themselves feminists. But when I was with my mother in Mali, when one day she was out and she, my brother and I was being with my grandmother and the rest of our family. And uh, the sister of my grandmother took me and the practice female genital, female genital mutilation on me, despite the fact that both my parents were against it. And so I started being an activist because of what I've been through at 19 years old because I wanted, uh, I didn't want other young girls or women to go through that pain. And so when I started my journey as a musician, my first interview, my first song was about female genital mutilation and the pain that people go through it. I choose to tell my story and uh, music was really an amplifier for that. And uh, because I didn't want to present myself as a polished, um, artists with uh, this image that is not real. I wanted to tell people that I went, I have my joys, my pains, my flaws, and that female genital, female genital mutilation was a big part of what made me who I am today. And I realized that my journey as an activist for almost six years, spreading the message, uh, the time that it took me and the impact that I had was it was enough for a young student, but it wasn't as big as just this first song and this first interview that I did, that the message just spread. And through music, because people could relate to pain. We all know pain. We all know joy. We all know what those emotions feels like. Even though a majority of people never went through female genital mutilation, they could relate to my pain. So this is something that I felt was really powerful. And also as a climate activist, when I decided to embark in the journey of uh, spreading awareness about a project called The Great Green Wall, what I did is a film documentary film because I wanted to share the stories of people living on the front line of climate change and what The Great Green Wall meant to them and how it could really change their lives and how we, as a society are having an impact on their life because uh, the Africa emits just 3% of C CO2. And uh, in the Sahel, people are really, really living on the front line of climate change without being the major causes of that climate change. So I wanted to give them a voice. So I traveled all along the Great Green Wall from Senegal to Ethiopia uh, in the desert, in urban uh, cities. and I went to people and I gave them a platform to share their stories. And that was very uh, essential to make the Great Green Wall a movement 
because it wasn't just about the Sahel, it was about the impact that the rest of the world has on the climate that was affecting the Sahel. So I find it that through, um, through music, through filmmaking, through art, either visual art, dance, it is so powerful because we connect directly human to human as people before being a musician, before being um, an activist, before anything, I'm a human being and I will relate to the emotions of another human being. So uh, the Great Green Wolf documentary uh, helps really bring awareness to, uh, to the project and help make it a movement. And so today I created uh, another project. It's a nonprofit called Code Green and it helps harness the power of creativity on the blockchain and help uh, um, the NFT space to become to embark in the sustainability journey. And so I launched Code Green because of that. We launched it at uh, COP26 and uh, we've partnered with uh, one of the biggest, well, the biggest uh, uh, women-led uh, NFT project called World of Women. And World of Women is about inclusivity. It's about diversity. It's about uh, not just women, but people empowerment. And so we are now doing our first uh, event soon, but we realized that really through art, it is so, so, so powerful. And that's why in music, there are untimes millions of people relate to, and films can completely shape the image of something. Like we, we, we see that Hollywood has been very important in the spreading of the idea of the American dream. So through films, we can really have an impact on our society. And uh, I find it uh, really, really uh, useful to, uh, to spread the right messages through art. And uh, this is something that I've been, uh, it's a mission that I started uh, 15 years ago. And I realized that it never changes, no matter the medium that you use, but with art, really uh, you can globally connect people and create movements. And so that is, the, that is what is my experience has been. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, you're truly on a mission, of course. Um, we used to believe that it is our rational brain that drives our decisions, but uh, it's truly our emotional side of our brain that truly makes our decisions. Um, we're uh, proud and we're, uh, uh, you're an aspiration to many of people. Uh, Miss Anna, continue what you're doing and uh, we wish you all the best. Now we move to uh, Jennifer. I think uh, Jennifer has a story to tell as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me here. I'm very, very glad and excited to share my story. At the age of 21, I made a trip to a country to the other side of the world that have changed my life complete, completely. That would change my perspective forever. Over there, I saw many people living in extreme poverty while I was selling domain and hosting in an IT company as a business development analyst. People said information technology will be the future. And don't get me wrong, but what will be the future for those living behind, I was wondering. Four years later, I was coming back to my country, Colombia, and in September 2015, I was starting my social enterprise, Tierra Grata. Together with my friends, we decided that we are going to give this population that still in Colombia are suffering by poverty, we're going to give them dignity. And mainly in the rural areas. Yes, the rural areas in Colombia, that ones that have been most affected by an internal conflict that have lasted more than 50 years and that have left those population without basic services. Yes, no water, no toilets, and no access to electricity. And I started to cross mountains, to cross rivers, to ride monkeys, to walk for hours to reach the most remote villages that even doesn't appear on anyone's map. And I found the most inspiring stories of that invisible Colombia that I didn't know and still to date, many Colombians don't know. And I fell in love with its potential, with its resilience to overcome poverty. And in that moment, I decided that together with them, we are going to bring basic services, those ones that have been denied for years, 
access to a dignified toilet, access to clean water, and access to clean energy. Today, Tierra Rata have been reached more than 12,000 people in 47 rural communities in Colombia, in five states in my country. And we are directly impacting FDG 1, no poverty, SDG 6, access to clean water and sanitation, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, and also F SDG 6, gender equity, because we are prioritizing women in our interventions. And 10 years after that trip to the other side of the world, Tierra Rata, uh, together with my team, we have created a, a rural development model that does just include the social technologies that we implement in our communities, but also a social intervention process with the aim to increase their productivity and their well-being. But we are not doing this in a vertical appro approach as, as usual. We are doing this together with them. We are identifying their needs, but also their capacities. We are doing this by listening to them in co-creation spaces, but also establishing a local committee within the same community so that them can be part of our, our team, like being our main partners, and all the, the projects can be implemented successfully. So this journey had taught me how to really get out of my comfort zone and also get me to understand that this world is many of different realities, but that we, our talents, commitment, passion, but most important, connecting with people through empathy, we really can change those realities. Because those people that for years have been invisible, today they are taking their developments by their own hands and they are part of their own development. So I invite you to join the mission, our mission. Let's make every rural community in the world full of opportunities, dignities, and well-being. Thank you. I remember I was giving a public speaking course and a guy came up to me and said, I want to be a speaker. I want to be a public speaker. And I asked him one question because that decides whether he's going to become one or not. And it was, what's your story? If you don't have one, you can't be on stage. Why should people listen to you? I'm glad, Jennifer, you took the stage. People like you should be on the stage. You said something, you said you crossed mountains. You actually moved mountains. You made 12,000 people visible after being invisible. And um, you've preserved the dignity of a lot of people in Colombia. Thank you for your efforts. Uh, you're a role model, role model for a lot of uh, people in this room. And uh, I'm one of them. Thank you once again. Um, now we move to uh, Miss Celine. I believe you have a story to tell. Please, this floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. How very lucky you are to be a woman. If you cannot get into a good university, you could just easily get married and your life would be saved and spared, said my little brother. That was the moment when I apprehended who I who I had to be, who I would be, the voice of change. My brother's words fueled my activism. I don't know which feeling was stronger, the anger or the sadness which broke my heart. I remember how I promised to take action in the morning because I know that if I want something to be changed, I have to be the one who changed it. I have sent an email to young women. I didn't really had any hope, um, but I wanted to get involved in the global gender equality movement, he for she. After starting the first he for she clubs amongst high schools um, in Turkey, I became the youngest representative of the movement in my country. Later on, I was elected as um, one of the few UN Women Global Equality Activists for a five-year program called National Gender Youth Activists. I have led several initiatives through which I have engaged with young people from all across the globe, crossing continents, um, listening to their stories, their ideas, and bringing their demands into the global space. However, being an activist, day by day, I, find, I found more things that have to be changed. I'm living in Istanbul. I do go to a private school, and I'm more on the lucky and more privileged side of my country, but I acknowledge that. And because of that, I believe it is and should be my responsibility to help young girls who do not have the same opportunities that I have.
I wanted to find a platform where I could, um, I didn't want it to be the voice of young women, but I wanted to create a platform where I could encourage and empower young girls to use their voices, not finding their voices. They already have a voice. They just need to be encouraged and empowered to start using their voices for things that matters to them. Secondly, being an uh, activist, um, adolescent girl, and a high school student at the same time, I think it is a blessing for me to see what's wrong in our community. And I, too, encountered obstacles regarding gender-based stereotypes, how society expects um, young girls to bring each other down um, and be you know, on the um, opposite sides rather than lifting each other up. That brings us to the start of my journey with founding the first girl love club in my country, Girl of Istanbul. I remember once again asking myself, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? Just when I was brainstorming about creating a platform to um, start on my mission, I, my roads crossed with the global Girl Up campaign. Seeing that Girl Up uh, started by United Nations Foundation was on a mission to um, help girls expand their vision, uh, train them to be better leaders, um, equip them for, uh, for, uh, for uh, equip them with um, the tools to be better leaders. I knew I had to be a part of it. Deep in my knew, uh, deep in my heart, I knew I had to be a part of it. However, Turkey didn't have any um, active clubs unfortunately. But again, I ask myself, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? I have sent an email to um, Girl Up HQ. You'll see that there are lots of sending emails in my story, sending lots of emails. <laughs> I started working um, on bringing the team together. I started working on uh, creating a work plan for us. A few months later, there I was. Helping, my, uh, helping the girls in my community to be better leaders. As Girl of Istanbul, we aim to work on as many topics as we can, from period poverty to mental health or eating disorders. Being teenage girls, are, being teenage girls ourselves, we are able to relate on another level with the girls we are working with and for, and hopefully, as you said also, uh, make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. Due to the pandemic outbreak, we were not able to host many activities face to face. But therefore, we decided to bring the girls together by using the unifying power of social media as a tool. Okay, here we go. These would include countless of IG lives and social media takeovers. Girl Up, my story, where for seven days we have partnered up with seven international Girl Up clubs, and girl leaders shared their stories. This was especially effective for us to understand different cultures and their issues. And the Girls Equal campaign, on this particular campaign, we created an, uh, created an atmosphere where we could inspire each other and get inspired by each other. The things you can do to create change um, on so, uh, you, the things you can do on social media to create change is not only limited to starting hashtag challenges on Instagram, even though that is incredibly effective, I must state. So I introduce you to the booklet series by Girl Up Istanbul, as you can see from the first slide. On December 2020, we launched an online booklet series called Outside of the Classroom where we featured four different topics that we're not being taught at school, however, they're very much in our lives. We aim to break the taboos about certain topics, which could be um, things from FGM to um, abuse. Uh, we wanted to share the facts with our audience, get information about these topics on a global level, and most importantly, um, learn more about the ways you can help, the, how you can contribute to the, to the movement. To provide the most accurate information, I'm incredibly proud to say that we have partnered up with youth-led initiatives who are the experts on the field. 
through the booklet series, we were able to reach to more than 200,000 young people. Alongside working with NGOs, uh, we also partnered up with UN agencies for our projects, and what, uh, one example would be the Youth Act talk show. We came together with UN Women Local and Regional Offices and Women's Entrepreneurship Development Fund to host the Youth Act talk show. On this one-hour show, um, we had interviews from the streets, interactive discussions for our audience to engage, and watch the social entrepreneurship journeys of the youth. As a young girl myself, I too know how crucially important it is for you to have a strong role model from flesh and blood who you can talk to, look up to, um, listen to, um, and learn from. Therefore, it was very important for us to start a series uh, where we could provide that. So on our Activist Sisters series, which stands for Activist Sisters, we have partnered up with 12 recognized women leaders from uh, Turkey, from different fields, different sectors, from different cities. We established a platform for young girls to discover their potential and get the support they need on this path. These are just obviously uh, a couple of the examples uh, we have achieved through the years and the foreshadowing of what we're going to do in the future with a strong focus and base on the SDGs. SDG 20, uh, 2030 goals on gender equality can be summarized around ending all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls, more girls in school, less enforced marriage, hopefully none, and more women in leadership positions, especially in economics and uh, political decision-making table. But how? The path to achieve these goals, to educate and empower women, starting when they are young girls. And this is what we do. We have a firm belief in every step we take, in every action we make, because we know that. And believe me when I tell you, when girls rise, we all rise. Thank you. When girls rise, we all rise. Definitely. Um, you did your homework, and one of the principles of storytelling is you have to do your homework. You analyze your communities, you knew where the problem was, and you addressed it, and you made things happen. Um, if that's not a change maker, I don't know what it is. Thank you, Selim, for your contribution. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached to uh, the end of um, this session. We will have a 10 minute break, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please keep your masks on all, um, all the time. Just to make sure you just take them off whenever you have a snack or coffee. Um, we'll be back in 10 minutes. So three, 10, exactly. And um, you cannot afford to be late. It only gets better. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The session will now begin. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I know some of you are still uh, grabbing some food. Please uh, make your way back to the tables, please. We're about to start the challenge. Um, Katrina, if you can help me just... Uh, I'm glad it's finger food or else you all have food coma and nobody is going to take part of this challenge. <laughs> Um, I believe it was a well-deserved break after um, the introductions and two interesting sessions. Um, now that we are all rejuvenated, it is time to get our creative juices flowing in an inspiration icebreaker session and learn key facts about the SDGs. We have just heard from the storytellers who each propose a solution to help amplify or achieve the SDGs. We have also heard from experts about how to develop a captivating story, and an overview of the dignified storytelling principles. Now, this is your chance to use them in practice. Uh, in this creative exercise, we encourage you to think both about what story you are telling and how you are telling story. We invite you to work in groups to develop a creative campaign as a storyboard that is grounded in deep respect for human dignity and which amplifies the solution, voices, and efforts of the change makers and communities featured in our story showcase. Please remember to integrate dignified storytelling principles and some suggestions about how to do this, in particular include the following principles. It's not my story. I do my homework. I am empathetic. Truth over headlines. In your teams, you'll tackle one of the, those two themes, women and girls, or climate change and biodiversity loss. The change makers and experts from the Can Leons and the United Nations Department of Global Communication will serve as mentors alongside teams in the de design sprint. I believe also the speakers you saw earlier will behave as mentors as well. Teams will have the opportunity to present their ideas, share feedback, and collectively identify the fundamentals for impactful storytelling for sustainable development while exploring new partnerships and opportunities to take those ideas forward. Make sure you have the tools you need to hack this challenge on your tables, including design sprint instructions, images from the story showcase speakers, you'll find them in envelopes on your table, pens, post-its, flip charts, uh, papers, a copy of the Dignified Storytelling Handbook to refer to as well. To start, we have provided some initial questions to consider, uh, which, you can, which can be found in the design sprint instructions. Once you have your storytelling process in order, work together with your team to shape your campaign. Some essentials to remember. The work you do with your team should promote action to advance your chosen solution or story and address the related SDGs. This could be done by changing a common way of seeing this issue or promoting behavior change on this topic. Speakers from the Story Showcase and Masterclass will be present to help you develop your idea and answer any questions as I mentioned earlier. We will come back together for a peer review process after the challenge. We have an hour exactly, 60 minutes to complete the challenge, and this timer starts now. 
I know some of you are still eating, but you can do that while eating as well. Good luck. Um, just a um, final request. We don't want to see silo tables. We want you all to um, come together so that we can work together. Sir, uh, ladies, um, if you guys can just come into the center so that we can form groups and uh, start this challenge. Sir, if you don't mind, just coming closer, thank you. Um, yes, yes, you sir, please help me. <laughs> we need your energy.
Salem, just you.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have one minute to go. Make sure you finalize your notes. And then we expect the mentors on each table to uh, share with us uh, the findings on each table. I expect that from Yusuf, Catherine, Selen, Jennifer, and um, um, who else did I forget? Christine, yes. Chris would uh, definitely share with us the findings. Catherine as well. You guys are done? I think you're, uh, you guys did a good job. <laughs> Yusuf, is your group ready? Yes, they're ready. All right, we will start with you. We would like you to, uh, either you or the team, just share with us and present the, uh, the findings. We need the rover mic, please. All right, yeah, please. After this table, we'll be moving to uh, Jennifer and uh, Christine's table. Yes, please join us on the stage. I'd love to see you on the stage. All right, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Here, here. Yeah. Hey there, how's everyone doing? So our campaign really stemmed from Inna's um, piece about bringing heart and art together and ensuring that you, you, art being a form of expression that really taps into empathy and people being able to connect with empathy and emotion. And so we wanted to bring two crucial uh, factors that are happening and, utilize, and bringing it and interconnecting it with different elements. So on one side, we have the Great Green Wall, which is a very passionate project of hers where, and of the Sahel region and different nations in, in cooperation, building out an amazing Great Green Wall of trees across the Sahel African region. And through that, it's empowering women through economic growth, touching on several different SDGs uh, gender equality, economic growth, life on land. And the stories that the women that are a part of that effort are these deep cultural issues that disempower women, such as FGM. So we have two sides to the story where we have this empowerment, but then we also have a very deep issue of disempowering women and not giving them the equality and the independence that their family deserves. Uh, and so one aspect that we're looking to tie these all, these two big issues together is by creating an opportunity for the global audience to get involved by adopting a forest through blockchain technologies like NFTs. And through that, raising enough mon money and funding to help survivors of FGM speak up and allow them to tell their stories in a way that will help other women and potentially break these uh, traditional cultural aspects that's been really a, a heavy lift to try to eradicate. Um, and so part of that is uh, using that technology, like I mentioned, to help build awareness, educate people in the community, and uh, also tackle climate change through that. Anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, maybe on Philip's advice, uh, there's so much interconnection between all the SDGs that it, uh, we got a We've got a lot of them, actually. Uh, but to pick three, it's actually uh, pr proving gender equality, but also um, uh, proving life on land. And we think the interconnection between them could be the economic growth. And then you pick three, but there are more SDGs involved in this solution. Yeah, this team is amazing. I couldn't have said it better. Um, uh, yeah, let me, I'll just add that one way that we're going to... Okay that will bring these stories to life is uh, by sharing this, the, the survivor's stories through one-minute videos, telling what they have gone through, but also showcasing their work in the Great Green Wall. So, I mean, you have, you have 
a whole community that is part of that process. So being able to tell their story through these one minute videos, but also the generational divide, like the grandmother, what's that story? Why does she believe in those things that she believes in when it comes to FGM? And then the new generation, what they believe in and how to combat it. Awesome. Um, Can you please ask them to introduce themselves? Oh, yeah, intros. <laughs> hey, I'm Tariq Mohammed. I am Corne van der Poel from the Netherlands. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> He's official. He has the SDG badge. Say? He's our SDG uh, uh, strategist. <laughs> Yeah, so if we have to summarize this, I think my team have done an amazing job of presenting this. Round of applause to the team. They're genius level. If we have to summarize it, we're going to empower FGM survivors to tell their own stories with mobile devices. That's going to create awareness in communities, in their local community, and also overseas. You watch the story overseas and you want to help out? You sponsor a forest. That forest produces food, which also helps with the climate, but provides economic opportunities to the FGM survivors. And in doing so, they have more empowerment to fight FGM. This is heart and art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, you can sanitize it? All right. Um, Jennifer, Christine. <laughs> All of you, please take the stage. Join them. Join them. You might join them, Jennifer, if you want to. Yes. All oh, right, it's okay. Then. So, this group, we were working on. Yes, so the project that we were working on is the Terra Grata that you've all heard about. And what we thought is that um, before talking about the medium, we're trying to target not the communities because they know about the, the, pro the problem, but we want to target the companies and the donors because what is needed at this point is funds and grants. So what we thought the campaign would be about a video that will be showed on TV, since in Colombia, TV is the most used medium of communication, and that this TV campaign will showcase the impact that one dollar or one pesos can do in Colombia. And this is how we want to target CEOs and people working at um, companies to really donate and join the cause. So. For, of, of course, the main, uh, the main campaign will be about a TV campaign. And we've also thought about uh, putting names to our community members, like Maria, who you can see on this picture. And when this person can actually relate to Maria and her problems and what she's dealing with, then uh, they would prob probably join uh, the challenge. So we've also thought about some activation campaigns that we could do on social media, podcasts, and radio, because in most of the communities, they don't even have access to electricity and to and TV to actually see our, our campaign. And most importantly, we stress on the fact that we didn't want to show personal stories of distress and misery, but we want to showcase Marias that are grateful and that are happy and just uh, show the impact that um, companies can have on Maria and her community. So this is it in a nutshell. I'm not sure if my colleagues want to add anything. Uh, just to add in that, oh, uh, Jennifer is leading an amazing project with all the SDGs, and we're trying to very, be very concrete on what those SDGs mean across Colombia and across the, the community she's working on. For example, SDG 6, 7, we're talking about the solar panels, or SDG 6 on the access to toilets itself, focus on how much it will cost and how impact your donation would make. So you know that he is, even if you are a company that is small business in Colombia, you are also helping a global agenda at the, the regional and the local level. I think given the fact that our focus is to reach out to funders and donors, it's absolutely important to communicate to them what their money is doing and to show about the kind of positive impact and transition that's happening 
from the starting till the end to till the you know sustainability of the impact they've made through small amount of money that they give or even the large amount of money that they give and the multiplier imp you know effect of the impact through that money is very important because our focus is again coming back to companies and donors and we're trying to make sure that from small grants that we are getting right now we transition towards big donors with less number of donors but large amounts of money so that's why the whole focus is a lot on showing how maria is growing how she is transitioning and using tv as a medium to make sure that we reach the masses as much as we can to convert to those number of donors yeah okay uh, i am shagun i am from restless development i'm daniel clarko from huge in europe brazil and i'm here on behalf of restless development too I'm Bruna Elias from Lebanon, and I'm also part of the Youth Power Panel from Lexus. All right, so obviously, big round of applause for this group. I thought that what they did was so excellent. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys an overview of their approach. It took us a while because we wanted to be very strategic and very deep. So we started with what the story was, and we treated uh, Jennifer like she was our client and sat down and said, what do you need from us? And so we were able to parse out the different elements that we would need to focus on from our stakeholders all the way to what the messages that would resonate with them would be, to what channels would be best, to how to tie that back into the sustainability goals, to all the way to who the direct person is, what do they need, what's their persona, how do you reach them. So it's very, very strategic, and I thought they were brilliant. I'm so grateful. And just to say, the client is happy, so... <laughs> She says she would use our campaign, so I'm very happy about that. So thank you. <laughs> um, a lot has been placed on this uh, stakeholder mapping, persona analysis, strategic development. I mean, they've done this in 60 minutes. What if we give them a day? A lot could have happened. Table number three. Please join us on the stage. No? <laughs> I'm going to summarize it on behalf of our group. We were having such a great time, we forgot to write something down, but uh, the conversation was, was just, you know, so engaging. Um, but I think, um, uh, on behalf of Girls Up, I, I think what we recognized was in Turkey, it's such a diverse and large country, really. What you have happening in Istanbul, perhaps, is different to, to the east and, and the rest of the country. So... One of the things that we talked about was actually how to go after different audiences. So there's a great point made um, around influencers such as teachers. So how can we um, start the education job, no pun intended, you know, around uh, teachers? And, and maybe actually we can use all of the SDG goals um, a, a, as, a way, as a way in, for want of a better expression, in order to also start the kind of um, gender equality co conversation. So... So I thought that was a really interesting um, way of um, thinking about it. And then we were also talking about the groundswell around youth and, and obviously women th them, themselves. Um, and there was a very inspirational story told um, about a family member, a young male family member who four years ago would have had very traditional views, um, but in the last few years, as a result of being um, involved in, in Girls Up, you know, because it's part of a, uh, connected through the family, he actually had his views changed. So that made us think a little bit about segmentation, actually, and the, and the way that we can, um, you, know, you know, approach different audiences and, and kind of change their views. So I think fundamentally we felt it wasn't possible to change everybody's view in, in, in Turkey right from the get-go. It's a society which rightfully is embedded in its cultures and traditions, but there were audiences that we could um, go after or, or target that where we could get the groundswell and, and the general sense of, of, of opinion um, to change. Um, and just lastly, I think also one of the things we had a really fruitful discussion around was other people like well-known women, successful uh, actresses or um, successful uh, women in business. Uh, uh, I think there was a story around a lady involved in football, which is quite a male-dominated uh, sport. So, you know, how also we can use them 
on our behalf. So in general, as a summary of the conversation, it was a little bit about different audiences and then you know, how we can get um, you know, influencers or, or women of influence to, to, to add to the story to kind of somewhat normalise the idea of gender um, equality. I don't know if you'd like to add anything as the... Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, um, just one thing to add would be we very much focused on SDG 17 as well, which is not a goal, but it's a um, goal for a partnership for the goals and how we cannot focus on one of the goals and expect others to solve around it, but if we, or how we, can, we cannot disregard one specific goal and how we need to... Um, how we need all hands on deck and how we need to incorporate the goals um, in the whatever we are doing. If it's climate, it is related to gender equality, for example. Um, governments, private sector, NGOs cannot focus on one of the SDGs and, again, like disregard uh, uh, the others. Um, we really like focused on that. We had a fruitful discussion regarding um, the partnership for the goals, and I just wanted to add that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies. All right. Working in groups um, and teams help us appreciate the great value of diversity amidst ourselves. Um, <clears throat> throughout the exercise, uh, I kept on thinking of the first principle of storytelling. It is not my story to tell. Everyone has the right to tell their story from their perspective, and we should support each other in getting our voices heard. It would be so much easier to achieve SDGs globally if we do our homework and research thoroughly with the goal of ensuring we prioritize truths over headlines. Let us remain empathetic in our approach to storytelling as well as providing solutions to pressing societal issues. The themes we focused on for this challenge, women and rights, uh, women and girls or climate change and biodiversity loss are highly significant and it is impressive how the teams have come up with such diverse solutions to addressing the challenges. Thank you, all of you. We shall now close the event on a high note by inviting a sensational poet, um, Shamal Bastaki, an award-winning poet and artist, and co-founder of Jara Collective. To grace our ears with one of her masterpiece poems, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to welcome Shamal Bastaki. Hi everyone. So in thinking about my practice as a poet, I often trace, trace it back to its etymological origins. Poetry, the Arabic word for poetry, sha'r, comes from the root word sha'ra, which means to feel. And in English, poetry comes from the ancient Greek poesis, which means to make. And so when you put what when you feel and then translate those feelings into making, but then also thinking about um, making something that makes other, fe other people feel, that to me is in essence what storytelling does. And you know, even though as, uh, as an experimentalist, some people call my, my work um, a little bit more kind of postmodern in which narrative is um, divorced of, of meaning um, and in which language is... Uh, uh, not granted as much de narrative depth and gravity, um, how can we still find meaning and how can we still create stories? And one question that has been uh, repeated in, uh, throughout these sessions is, um, can these important messages of the, of the SDGs be translated through craft? How can poets and artists more generally bring these SDGs to life? Um, and uh, my own practice is very people-based. It's very uh, community-based. And um, 
um, interviews are a very central part of my practice. I think about relational aesthetics. And so what, are the, what, what is implicated in involving people in your creative process? Um, how can you think about questions of ethics, of consent, of you know, representation while thinking about who gets to represent these voices and who gets to decide whose voices get, get to be represented, whether um, representation is even um, um, important in... Uh, in the, the various contexts, and how can we be more conscious of, of which voices are being presented and uh, with what degrees of nuance. Um, and so, as mentioned also, one of the important um, aspects of the dignified storytelling principles is to do your homework, to know um, what you're representing and, and why. Um, and so all of these questions kind of intersect with some really inspiring work that we've seen uh, on the ground with um, change makers and storytellers. And with, um, without further ado, here's a poem called Woven. On the ground, we are on the ground feet pounding with the pulse of the sun in our veins. We share its rays, every last living thing, crawling onwards, soaking light, your light, my light, one source, al-masdar wahid. It rains, stains the almost night with crimson, coral, cobalt. Tell me the rest, my guest, this is no test. Invest in this crescent of color thread through with the dust of a pale, broken vase from several thousand years ago. This cacophony of exchange ranges from the dawn of the stone ages, a barter of things, wood for stone, salt for shells, gold sold for cold silks, a barter of ideas and tongues. Questions and solutions, rituals and contributions from the ancient Agra of Athens to the Industrial Revolution, to the Tertullias of Buenos Aires, to the Mialis of Bremi. All dusking to now, a world woven into itself and with itself more than ever before, woven like the dusk, like the warp and weft of a Lancashire loom, woven like the, like the hunt of the unicorn, woven like the sedu cladded tent in which strangers turn to guests, woven like the khus being braided between Khala Afra's fingers. In her basket, everyone belongs. Put your glacial palm in mine, we'll breathe this dirt together, build bridges out of bricks over puddles, ponds mulling in some funny auntie's backyard. Bonds burgeoning, rustling, like a leaf less fragile by the beat as it tempers the wind. Will these tempests prosper? A wonder. How goodly creatures there are here. Can I win alone? On the ground. We are on the ground, hush, stifle the sound of the fear that floods the chambers of your heart. Your vocal drain is coarser than the mountains in these easts. Envision a skin bread greener than yours, a tooth carved sharper, a blood born bluer. A chant spun wholly on the tongue of thy neighbor. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, islands and highlands aligning like a flashlight in the fog. Microdifference is the charm. Extend a kindly arm now. Hold the other. Other the hold. Hang tight to one another. One source, one sun. Run from the voices that tell you to run. We are one on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Shema. She said something at the beginning. Shi'ar is to feel and poem or poetry is to make um, through those uh, number of metaphors we heard in her uh, poem, we did feel, um, and of course, through, through poems, we can make change, and we can use poems to make things happen. 
through stories. Thank you, Shema. That was wonderful. I believe um, it was a good way to end the session on high notes. <clears throat> it has been a powerful SDG storytelling lab, and I was glad that I saw uh, most of you here today. And I thank all of the speakers as well who took part of the stage, and I thank the groups that also present us with their findings and solutions. The role of each member plays in achieving the global goals um, today was vital. The Dubai 2020 Expo has given us a great opportunity to learn and advance the growth of dignified storytelling initiative, its principles, and its role in achieving the SDGs. If you're traveling, safe travels back to home, and if you're going back to your offices, please do take the pledge and become dignified storytellers. Thank you for being here with us today, and we look forward to you soon.